Good morning. Uh, I'm Ben Cronin, CEO and founder of Kicker. So what do we do? So Kicker, essentially, what our service does is we've got, we provide our customers with aggregated access to company houses and business registries all over the world. So when we started the company in 2007, we had 12 countries in our network, and now we've grown that network to be over 180 uh, official government registries around the world. So essentially, we have a platform, a website, that you can access our service, and we've also APIs that we give to customers who use us for a variety of uh, functions, primarily, primarily uh, for onboarding, cleansing and remediation of customers. So we're very much focused on uh, our sandpit is, is for companies only, and we help our customers identify um, their customers. So in particular, we're, we're, uh, we've, we've a lot of banking customers. Our principal customers come from ba uh, banking, financial sector, legal um, and accountancy firms who need to access data in real time that they can rely on. And that's very important in a KYC function in particular and anti-money laundering. So our, our Principal customers would be the likes of Citibank, JP Morgan, uh, Goldman Sachs, um, and over 50 banks worldwide who come to us because they know there's veracity in the data that we supply to them. So we give them access to uh, the golden record, as it were, for, for companies in particular. So we, we think we have access to data in real time that provides an appropriate bedrock for building blockchain. So we've got Keen here, who's going to, who's tech, who's going to go through uh, how, how are we going to apply our existing technology? Thanks very much, Ben. <clears throat> okay, so Kicker's API is an abstraction layer above multiple underlying blockchain or underlying registry technologies. Our API has been used for many years to power our own website, but more and more, um, the APIs are being used for KYC solutions, including uh, the onboarding of new customers, the cleansing of customer data, and the ongoing monitor and monitoring and maintenance of that data. So um, the key requirement for these processes, what we've learned from these processes is essentially that the, the goal in company record is the, the, the key piece of information that's required. And that consists of the name of the company, the legal name, the legal number, the jurisdiction, the address, and the status of the company. So our customers make decisions based on this information, um, whether to onboard a company, lift the credit limit, or so on and so forth. But how do they prove in a year's time um, that the, that the decisions that they made were based on this information. So how, how can they prove that the, the data hasn't been tampered with, for, for example? So that's where blockchain comes in. Um, when you write a transaction to a blockchain, it provides this proof because once the data is input into a public blockchain or a private blockchain, the data becomes immutable when it transfers across the different nodes in the network. So what we're using is the block generation time is proof that it existed at a particular time and date. The more confirmations you have, the more valid the transaction. So this is just an example here of a number of arbitrary transactions that are happening on a blockchain, and you have a kicker transaction in the middle there. So once that's sealed into a block, you see it has a block time and one confirmation. So as, confirm as transactions happen, subsequent transactions happen, and they're sealed into blocks, the confirmations go up of the original transaction. So after an arbitrary number of blocks, you choose a threshold, uh, that record is then written in stone. So our challenge essentially was to take company data uh, the golden record as such, and uh, deploy that data onto multiple blockchains. So to do this, we built two APIs. The first one is called the Company Naming Service, which is akin to something like Who Is on the Internet, where we facilitate the lookup, the simple lookup um, of company data. We send that back in the JSON format and uh, hash the data so that it's suitable for deployment on blockchain. Then we also built the CROM, which is this Company Registration's Oracle module, which is an abstraction layer above multiple um, uh, blockchain technologies. So one single call and we can deploy to blockchain. We put the demo website for today just to show you how the two APIs tie together. So this is just some examples of the, the calls. The APIs are RESTful APIs and you can see here the CNS takes the arguments of jurisdiction and company code and that will ret return back a JSON structure that we then hash and store in our database. And the hash can be then looked up as another call on, that data on, on the API to retrieve the JSON again. So the hash is used for deploying on blockchain. So our CROM essentially has a few, a few API calls that are quite simple again. We have deploy and retrieve are the two main functions. We pass in a blockchain ID depending on what's supported by the CROM itself. And you pass in a hash, it will return back a transaction ID. And to retrieve the data, you pass in a transaction ID and it returns back the hash. 
So this is just, so what we wanted to demonstrate today was that we can deploy the same information to two different blockchains, but in completely different ways. Um, so for example, this is Bitcoin. So we're using um, the deploy function on it. We pass in the ID of the, the network or the classes we want to instantiate, and we pass in the hash value. So what that does is it will invoke a, an underlying concrete Bitcoin class, and it, it, it communicates them with the Bitcoin node using JSON RPC. So the procedure then is we generate a new raw transaction on the network. We embed the hash in the OP return field. So the OP return field is a 40 byte uh, field that you can add to any transaction in blockchain, in Bitcoin. We then send the transaction to a well-known address and we call get status on the CROM API to figure out how many confirmations there have been to get the, uh, the, the, block hash, the block time and also then to return the hash value. So we can call retrieve at any point then after that to get that value. So with Ethereum then is quite different. Uh, we call it in the exact same way. Um, this time we invoke the concrete K Ethereum class. Under that then we communicate with the node using JSON RPC again. So it's the same at that point to Bitcoin. So then what we do is we dynamically generate a smart contract with the hash value encoded into the code itself. And this is the little clever bit that we do. We, look, we, we reverse look up the CNS to do a company lookup on the hash itself and then we get back company information so we can actually embed more information on the smart contract, such as the company name, number, and so on as well. We compile that using SolC on the Ethereum node, and we write the contract then to Ethereum in a new transaction. And when we call get status, then it'll return back um, the block hash, the confirmations, how many confirmations have happened, and the block time eventually. And also the most important thing that we get from this is the contract address uh, to give us back the smart contract so that we make calls on it. So without further ado then, I'll just bring up the demo. Um, so this here is uh, our little website that we built. This uses our standard API to look up company information. So if I just type in uh, PayPal, just to, it does, uses autocomplete just to fill in some fields here. So we can look up, say, PayPal Europe here. And what we get back here then is data from the CNS, the company naming service. <clears throat> so it's a JSON format, but it's printing it, just printing it out here so we can see it. So you can see you have the name, status, country code, country address, and a few other bits and pieces. So the code here, if I click on that, it'll actually show you the CNS call here. It has the jurisdiction here and the company code. That returns back JSON data, which we see on the screen here. We also have the slug format here, which uh, is, is, it's an internal thing that we use for other processes that we have. You also then see the hash down below here, and this is what we actually want to deploy to blockchain. So we can look up the CNS on any of those, those three uh, fields, just makes calls out based on, on the different type of ID. So if we wanted to deploy to, to blockchains, then this part of it is the CROM part. So I can select, this. the CROM is called to, to return back uh, which networks are supported. So a Bitcoin, Ethereum, and a test blockchain here. So I'm just going to deploy to Bitcoin and so you can see a deployment happened there with, with zero confirmations. And you just might see an alert popping up on the screen there from my Bitcoin wallet there to show that the transaction happened. <clears throat> I'm also going to deploy to Ethereum. And immediately what I'm going to do is just watch those because I have a miner set up on Ethereum so that it may, yeah, so I have a miner set up there. So what will happen is this, this bit here is calling it get status on the blockchain continuously. So eventually what happens is the, the, block is, the transaction is sealed into a block and we get back our transaction ID. So I have one confirmation here on Ethereum already. On Bitcoin, it's a little bit different. I have a test network set up in Docker because going through the, the, the Bitcoin network will take too long to mine. So I'm just going to call make generate on that and that will put, a, put the transaction to a block or see, put some blocks in after on the, uh, the network. So if I call that four times, I've set the threshold of four confirmations to give me, give, me, give me a green light. And at that point then I can call, we can retrieve the hash from the blockchain. So you can see Ethereum is still working away, the miner is still working at that point. So just to prove that that worked, um, I'm gonna to go to, I have a, my standard Bitcoin wallet here. And you can see the re most recent transaction is there. It's not confirmed yet fully because this requires six confirmations, but I can take uh, the raw transaction here uh, copy raw transaction, and I just pass it into this little helper uh, page that I wrote. So you can see that the code, the raw transaction here. And if you look down below, you'll see on the, in the, uh, the transaction, there's an OP return field. And this contains uh, just an encoded version of the, the hash itself. So we decode that down here, and we can call the CNS hash then to do the, the, the complete 
uh, turn around and uh, complete the circle and get the data back. Um, on Ethereum, it's slightly different. We have a smart contract. So what I'm going to do is um, go back to my deployment here. I have five confirmations now. So what I'm going to do is get the, the smart contract address and take that and just pass it into. Now I can call directly call retrieve hash from our API here, uh, which will get back the hash itself. But just to demonstrate the smart contract in action, if I pass the address in here, and I'm just going to right-click and view the source for this at the moment. So this is this is a simple Web three um, JS smart contract invoker. Um, you can see here the contract is, is specified with this JSON interface here. So just embedded that in the code, and we also then have the contract address here that's specified through the HTML form. So once we, once we have the contract and specify the interface, we can call methods on it. So I've got a few methods there: get name, get code, get status, get country, so and get get hash, get hash being the most important for us. So if I call that, get company details, it actually calls a smart contract, gets back that information, and you can see again, we have the hash here um, to, to retrieve the original information back. So just one more thing then, I can just to prove that that smart contract it works um, using the standard Ethereum wallet, um, I can go and add that contract in here, if it lets me. Maybe I have too many there. Okay, that's okay. Yeah. So if I go to watch contract, put in the contract address here, it's going to name it uh, PayPal Europe. And what I need then is the JSON interface then to make calls on that function, on, on that smart contract. So we'll copy that in. Sorry now. So I'll pass that in here. Click on OK. So the, con the contract has been added there, so it's PayPal Europe. So if you look in here, then it's just calling those functions, get name, get status, get country ISO, get hash, and get code. So it's again, returning back the hash. So the hash being in the database then proves that that data existed at a particular time and date. And our API then can be used to retrieve that information. So just to go back to the presentation then. So in conclusion then, Kicker basically provides access to live company information. And blockchain augments this data by providing a proof of existence. The CNS that we've built facilitates a quick and easy lookup of this company data. <coughs> it allows us to hash the data to prepare for blockchain. And then it also allows us to reverse look up the data so that we can retrieve the original data again. And we do encourage our customers to store the JSON themselves, store the hash value themselves, store the transaction ID themselves so they can in independently verify this data. Uh, the CROM then facilitates this, uh, the deployment of the hash to the blockchain with a single call, uh, look up of the state of, status of the hash to figure out whether it's been sealed into a block, how many confirmations there have been, and the time it was deployed. And it also then allows us to retrieve the hash from the blockchain as well. So we're currently adding support for more networks. We have a partner in the UK called Credits, um, and they have a private blockchain solution, which gives us more flexibility in terms and more control over the network itself for a private scenario. So just let Ben finish off on that. Yeah, I mean, just in terms of using credits in a private uh, network, because so many of our customers are banks and if they're sharing data, it may be more appropriate for them to develop on, on a private network where there's a node in each of the banks and they're sharing this fundamental information that they need to, to keep up to date and to keep on top of, uh, you know, to, because the big issue that we see in banks all, all the time is that their existing books go out of date all the time. We're talking about simple things like company names are changing, registered addresses are changing, a company's status changes. The banks really have no way of picking up that in real time. Our solution, our, our monitor based on our existing APIs is very powerful in, in that it can pick up same day when a, a change happens to, the, to a company. So if that's then pushed up into, into a node of a, of a blockchain, then the banks, uh, the banks that are part of that network can get their data also updated in real time, which is, which is a very powerful prep, uh, proposition for, for banks. Um, so we're, we're finished, uh, we, we're, we, we came over from Dublin yesterday, so we've come a long way, so please come to our booth, which is just beside the door, um, we're, here for, we're here all week, so um, thank you for your time. <laughs>